Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to Gender and Society. This is lecture number 7 where uh, we will be talking about gender in postcolonial studies. Um, just to give you a background of uh, what postcolonial um, studies or postcolonial theory uh, talks about. Um, so much of um, the idea of postcolonial theory you know is again very um, very very broad and has been used across disciplines in a variety of uh, ways and so um, there have been uh, you know various ways of defining postcolonial um, theory and postcolonial um, the idea of postcolonialism so um, here what um, we will be um, looking at is how has the idea of the postcolonial um, been uh, you know engaged with the question of um, the creation of certain gender relations, um, the negotiation of certain gender uh, politics uh, in the context of colonialism, in the backdrop of colonialism and um, we will be seeing that how uh, you know several of these negotiations actually create the post-colonial subject. So the relationship between post-colonial theory and gender theory um, that oftentimes gives rise to what we understand to be the post-colonial subject and we will look at um, you know some of these selected examples of um, creation of the post-colonial creation of the post-colonial uh, subject in the context of South Asia by looking at some of the significant works um, that scholars have um, you know done over the uh, years. Um, so um, to start with an understanding here the political struggles uh, around um, colonialism around colonial rule have shown the coloniality of gender and gender order of colonial struggles and this is precisely um, what we are going to look at uh, in this uh, discussion in this lecture. So to give you a background from where does the idea of the postcolonial come from uh, it is um, one of the first uh, sources of the idea of postcolonial theory um, are the waves of feminisms as you um, have seen that the first, second, third ongoing waves um, each addressing a different issue, each addressing a different issue of equality, of rights, of privilege, etc. So that is one of the significant sources of um, a discussion on postcolonial uh, theory and gender. The next uh, source comes from the decolonial uh, discussions, decolonial um, ideas and the independent struggles against um, again the backdrop of colonial uh, colonialism. The struggles for rights and recognition in the diaspora which is an ongoing um, negotiation and the indigenous rights campaigns. So these are uh, some of the significant sources, some of the significant places, platforms um, where we see uh, you know um, the discourse of post-colonialism, um, the power dynamics, identity politics etc. play out and shape out um, various of these uh, gender negotiations. Um, the the ideas that emanated uh, from uh, these discussions contributed to the intellectual developments of postcolonialism and gender theory. So um, we see that uh, Connell in 2015 pointed out that decolonial and political struggles by women in the global south have produced powerful theorizing about the coloniality of gender. So what needs clarification at this point is that uh, we are talking about these categories of people, um, categories of women, categories of men, um, geographic areas of, um, of the world, uh, yet we are talking uh, you know in economic terms for example when we say global south or global north and um, you know 
although the political aspect of um, colonialism uh, is uh, you know uh, really important um, it cannot be ignored that the socio cultural ramifications the uh, socio cultural context of colonialism created several power geometries created several um, understandings particularly around gender and how gender has been at the center of all these um, um, you know endeavors all these political endeavors cannot be overlooked and that is where gender plays a very very important important role to understand um, the colonial dynamics um, and uh, you know how the post colonial subject is a product of that history. So, we see that there are uh, some converging concerns of post colonial and gender theory. The first one is a concern to understand and theorize from and challenge the power dynamics of marginality and difference. So, the idea of the margin, the idea of to be on the edge, the idea of to be on the uh, border versus um, the idea to be uh, in the center that that is a very important very central concept when we talk about the production of the post colonial subject. The second point um, subjectification of the other and how the subjects of women and post-colonial become known, contained and controlled. So, not just is the uh, you know the other as a category is created as we as we see, um, it is also uh, you know subjectified and how the you know subjects of women, subjects of post-colonial subject um, you know um, they actually uh, grow out of the discursive formations, they become known, they become um, you know controlled out of this is another um, concern um, when we look at uh, the, po the relationship between post-colonial and gender theory. The third uh, concern here is the challenging of epistemological and ontological assumptions surrounding colonial and gender relations across the global north and south. As I said that uh, although we are talking in terms of um, the um, political, the economic um, you know uh, struggles, economic uh, ramifications, inequalities, um, but then uh, you know uh, when we talk of the colonial um, idea, the idea of the colonial and the post-colonial um, you know we cannot avoid or um, it is rather problematic if we avoid uh, you know talking about um, the socio historical context. So, we were talking about that uh, the idea of the margin is uh, you know forms increasingly important in this discussion and we see that um, the post colonial gender theories um, critique the operations of power that create normative claims about the value of masculine Eurocentric knowledge and practices. So, as you can imagine there are these um, gendered arrangements that are either presumed or assumed and they um, you know they actually uh, reflect on several of these political um, negotiations and uh, one of the um, assumptions on which um, much of the ideas of the margin and the center is premised on is the um, idea of a masculine Eurocentric knowledge um, um, and practices uh, as a value system. So, um, that is one of the reference points that we have to keep in mind in this regard. Now, we have seen that uh, one of the uh, pioneers in, um, in, this, uh, in this field uh, in post-colonial studies, um, Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak has um, constantly reminded us you know how um, colonialism was gendered and um, here are two ways that you know she reminds us that if in the context of colonial production the subaltern has no history and cannot speak, the subaltern as female is even more deeply in shadow and subaltern is a concept we will look at uh, towards the end of this lecture, but at this point I want to make a point uh, um, uh, you know carry on with the discussion that uh, you know if in the context of the colonial production the subaltern has no history and cannot speak you know um, and then the subaltern as female is even more deeply uh, in shadow.
So as we have seen the idea of the margin uh, in becomes increasingly important in this uh, discussion and uh, you know we have seen that there are several referral points, several reference points uh, keeping in mind um, that these margins and the uh, you know core uh, is uh, actually uh, envisioned, is actually assumed. And uh, one of the starting points here is the idea that post-colonial gender theories critique the operations of power that create normative claims about the value of masculine Eurocentric knowledge and practices. So this is one of the premises on which uh, you know the margins are drawn is the value that is attached to the Eurocentric knowledge and practices um, and then much of these uh, Eurocentric values and practices often are attached with the label of um, the masculine uh, label. And we have seen that um, over time, uh, one of the um, you know pioneers uh, in this uh, idea of post-colonial um, theory, Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, has um, you know constantly reminded us that uh, not just uh, is the idea of colonialism or the practice or the politics of colonialism gendered, but it is also um, you know. Um, falling heavy on the category of female and, and she says that if in the context of colonial production the subaltern has no history and cannot speak, the subaltern as female is even more deeply in shadow and subaltern is an idea we will see um, towards the end of this lecture but at this point I just want to uh, you know make a um, introduce the idea that um, you know, not just we are talking about a single margin here, this margin that we are talking about is, um, you know, very nuanced and, uh, you know, there are multiple versions um, or multiple layers to this margin that we are talking about. And the margins constituted through the gendered post-colonial political economy are silent, silenced center is how uh, Spivak actually describes the margins. So the challenge, uh, you know, um, the series, the challenge, the hierarchical binaries of center, margin, self, other, north, south and uh, male, female. So we see that, uh, you know, this is a discussion that has been, um, you know, ongoing for several decades about the binaries and not just the um, existence of the binaries, but also the existence of a hierarchy for these binaries. So, um, you know, is the center privileged than the margin, is the north privileged than the south, um, is the male privileged than the female. So, all these, um, you know, discussions are around the center and the margin and, um, and not just, uh, you know, a descriptive um, sort of binary, but also, um, you know, an analytical um, as an analytical category um, of hierarchy. And we also see that um, another pioneer uh, in this um, idea, uh, Chandra Mohanty, um, talks about the politics of difference and diversity that the um, colonial and post-colonial experiences, uh, you know, across the world um, is uh, definitely, um, you know, not uh, universal, it is definitely not the same. And um, the difference and diversity um, that we see in this context, um, you know, they are the result of these political uh, negotiations um, that uh, went on. So, then what um, or how do we understand the post-colonial subject? So, who is the post-colonial subject and how do we understand that post-colonial subject? So, uh, one of the, um, you know, earliest works that we see of the subjectification of the other is by Franz Fanon where um, in Black Skin and White Masks, um, he talks about how gender is constituted within the colonial subject and um, this is one of the you know earliest earliest works that looks about the um, creation of the other, the creation of um, you know a lesser privileged um, um, other um, in, in the colonial context. And the subject positions of woman and man are understood as embedded within the colonial project. Um, and with respect to how is it, you know, embedded within the uh, colonial project with re relation to gender relations, gendered subject positions and gendered embodiments. So, um, you know, it is a multi-layered concept that, um, you know, how we understand this um, post-colonial uh, subject of um, the positions of woman and man and, uh, you know, it is it's, it's embedded within this complex uh, network. So, one um, 
lens uh, to understand this uh, creation of the post-colonial uh, subject or creation of the subject or creation of the other or creation of the margin, however you want to look at it, comes from Edward Said's idea of the Orientalism. And the idea of Orientalism is, you know, talking about the mode of discourse for representing the other and there are various ways um, the other can be represented through images, through vocabulary. So, it is a discursive um, formation of the other um, over and over again to emphasize that there exists an um, other who is often you know less privileged. It is also the idea of orientalism is also a style of thought uh, which is based on a distinction between the east and the west, the orient and the occident again. So, uh, it is a style of thought that gets translated to an idea of the geographical difference between the east and the west um, or as um, some scholars have used um, orient and the occident. And it is also the idea of orientalism also functions as a corporate institution and network of vested interests. And um, we find expressions of that in congresses, universities, foreign service institutes, etc. So, the idea uh, as you can see um, it is not just a discursive formation of the margins of the other of the lesser privileged, but it is also a way of thinking, a style of thought and it is also um, translating itself into tangible um, actions such as um, you know how institutions or how corporations are um, you know built and uh, networked. So, you know it, it traverses this whole um, you know continuum of from the intangible to the tangible. So, what was the role of orientalism in defining Europe? So, orientalism we know um, you know for sure defined the other defined you know um, the marginal the other um, the uh, lesser privileged, but what was its role in defining Europe which was um, supposedly um, the center. So, what happened is there were contrasting conceptions of the image, the idea, personality and experience. So, uh, you know a difference can only happen um, or a difference can only happen in, a, in, a, in an effective way when there is a contrast in conceptions. And this is exactly what happened uh, you know with orientalism is that um, you know several images, ideas, personalities, experiences etc. were put forward that were completely in contrast uh, to each other and that in a way went a long way to um, define what Europe is or what European being European um, meant. Um, however, I do want to point out that even this category of being European was taken up um, by scholars to um, investigate that even you know being European um, the meaning kept shifting over time uh, which I will talk about later um, uh, here. And we also see that these assumed um, hierarchy of superiority and inferiority. So, this uh, idea this assumed hierarchy became hegemonic um, which is um, Gramsci's idea of the dominant and accepted by consent as conventional wisdom or common sense um, in Europe. So, um, it is not just again a binary of um, contrasting uh, conceptions, but it also resulted in a hierarchy which um, you know um, became hegemonic which became um, the dominant discourse. So, now, how do we understand the colonized as objects to the colonizers? And again, here we see um, you know Edward Said's idea that um, the colonized people are something one judges as in a court of law, uh, something one studies and depicts as in curriculum, something one disciplines as in a school or prison, and something one illustrates as in a zoological manual. So, you know the, uh, the subject or the category of colonized people uh, were reduced um, to um, you know um, something that one judges that one studies, that one depicts, uh, that one disciplines and that one illustrates. So, as you can see this was all you know translating into government um, politics, into um, the political uh, negotiations of colonialism and um, you know the, the uh, socio-cultural context is, is 
deeply uh, embedded in, in this negotiation. The oriental is contained and represented by dominating uh, frameworks and um, we have uh, the objects of study of otherness uh, and non-autonomous and non-sovereign. So, all of these acted as signifiers, as descriptors for um, the colonized objects, the colonized um, you know, um, people who, who became the objects to the colonizers. So, if we look at um, how the idea of gender and nation played out in this, con in this context, um, particularly for South Asia, particularly um, the uh, negotiations that went on in South Asia, in colonial South Asia, we see that um, you know several trends um, emerge. So, we see you know um, scholarly uh, discussions on trade, colony nationalism, independence. We see, um, you know, the more socio-cultural um, aspects of colonialism uh, through nationalism, um, asking the various women's questions. And then we see a whole, um, you know, uh, trend on gender and nationalism. And we will see, um, you know, how each one of these um, actually um, pans out. Also, very, very, um, you know, um, important in this context is to understand um, you know the idea of modernity or modernities. So, is there you know single idea of modernity or are there multiple modernities and um, if yes I mean uh, how do we understand um, them. So, the idea of modernity grew and spread through processes of colonialism and became integral to the nation state system that emerged. So, um, you know, it was really a product, it was an idea, it was a, um, a way of living, it was, um, you know, a lifestyle choice, um, it was an economic process, however you want to define modernity. Um, the idea, it actually, um, you know, um, was born out of the colonial um, ideas and then it became integral to the nation state system. So, um, you know, it became uh, um, um, expressed in various ways and um, within the nation state system. It entails a narrative of progress, a break from an irrational tradition in which subjects always overcome and surpass that which came before. That um, it, you know, uh, when we say that something is, um, you know, uh, modern or, 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 you know, so we, we refer to the idea of modernity it comes with it with an understanding of progress of advancement and uh, which is um, different from how we understand um, you know tradition and um, here uh, we need to be careful to um, you know understand how we define modernity how we define tradition and it is often a politics that is at play um, which defines tradition and modernity so um, it's it's always um, you know um, more um, uh, effective to talk about the politics of tradition or the politics of modernity than just um, you know the simple binaries um, if at all and then modernity is put into effect through science and management projects, the development of new social institutions like prisons, hospitals, factories, schools, the new ways of organizing people. So, as societies were evolving, um, you know, um, at this point of history, so as they were going through colonialism and, you know, um, as they were um, get, gaining consciousness um, to, um, you know, overthrow colonial rule. So, all these processes put uh, you know um, people through the modernity process and uh, much of it was put uh, in effect through the application of science and management projects and um, which brought with them new ideas of organizing people, new ideas of um, networking um, within the society and beyond. So, Th these are uh, some of the important ways in which modernity can be understood, but um, this is definitely not an exhaustive way of understanding modernity. Um, but in this context, um, you know, um, this is um, going to be important. So now, let's look at some of the key works that have been done um, in this context, and I start with um, the Nation and its Fragments uh, by Partha Chatterjee. So, the 
we see that um, this is one of the earliest works um, you know that looks at um, the process of nation building and um, what were the uh, key characteristics, what were the roles um, that gender had played um, in that nation building um, process. So, we see that the material superiority of the West had to be matched by learning modern science and arts to overthrow the colonial rule. As we just saw that the idea of modernity gets expressed uh, through the application of science, technology, um, management skills. So, um, you know there was a need to um, you know match the material superiority of the West um, in order to overthrow the rule or overthrow the colonial role of the colonizers. The inner core of the national culture, its spiritual essence had to be preserved, protected and strengthened and this is how Chatterjee describes um, that um, you know he is talking about the home world dichotomy, he is talking about the inner and the outer um, you know spheres and um, you know one way that the home and the world these spheres um, actually got defined and redefined and negotiated was with an identification of various gender roles. And uh, we see that as he says the ideological framework within which nationalism resolved the women's question was this um, home world dichotomy. That there was a need to uh, build, uh, to have this, uh, you know, um, idea of a nation building through a framework, and this framework was, um, you know, very effectively provided by um, the homework dichotomy, um, and um, you know, much of these, um, you know, the idea of the home world uh, dichotomy was informed or was um, designed, crafted on the principles of gender roles. So, what he says is um, there was a new patriarchy of nationalism, a new social responsibility for women and what was that? It was maintaining cohesiveness of family life and solidarity with the Ken group and it came um, as an idea of female emancipation which was associated with the idea of sovereign nationhood um, and thus nationalism brought a new and legitimate subordination for um, the women um, of the um, country. So, this is um, you know, how Partha Chatterjee talks about uh, you know the in, in nation and its fragments that um, you know the negotiation, um, the rearrangements of relationship, the re-networking of relationships between the um, inner and the outer sphere of um, the society was heavily done with um, using gender as a vehicle um, for that um, you know rearrangement. The next um, key uh, work that was um, done by Ibn Nisina in 95 looked at the idea of colonial masculinity. So, uh, this work actually um, engages very very significantly talking about how gender was not just important, but gender was at the center of um, much of these um, you know colonial politics. And she uses the case of the manly Englishman and the effeminate Bengali in the late 19th century. So, Empire building was represented as a masculine enterprise as um, Sinha points out in her work that um, you know it was um, the, um, the men's job or it was a masculine enterprise to build an empire and um, the gendering of the space of the empire and the activities of empire building as a masculine sphere was related to social and political problems in Europe. So, much of these um, you know um, uh, negotiations actually um, had to be validated, had to be rechecked um, in relation to the social political problems in Europe. And uh, in doing that, what Sinha um, analyzes is the making of the imperial race led to the restoration of manhood. Um, and, and what led to the restoration of manhood through the athletic activities, scouting movement, adventuring, etc. So, what we see is that 
at that juncture, at that historical juncture, there was a requirement to differentiate between um, us and others, um, the two categories. And the way that um, the colonizers, um, you know, differentiated the us and others um, was through using gender. And, uh, you know, um, the Englishmen were um, labeled or they, uh, you know, um, they thought themselves to be manly and then the um, Bengali men were, you know, much of the colonial um, activities um, in the, um, you know, um, eastern part of um, the um, country was going on. Um, so, the, it was effeminized were actually, um, you know, if we go by the hierarchy and the hegemony discourse, um, then they were effeminized and that solved uh, to a large extent, um, you know, um, the power dynamics, um, the uh, the power dynamics that was required for um, the colonial rule. So, again you see that gender was, uh, you know, not just um, a significant factor, but it was, you know, very, very central to the um, idea of colonial dynamics um, in 19th century. The next significant work that we find um, you know, um, shedding a lot of important light in this context is Contentious Traditions by Lata Mani. And where Mani talks about the abolition of Sati in 1829, which was a founding moment in the history of women in modern India, of course. However, um, as um, Mani, uh, you know, contends um, in this work, that we see that these debates around Sati were premised on how these ideological positions were arranged. And what we see is what happened, um, you know, around the, um, you know, debates around Sati is that increasingly women became emblematic of tradition and the reworking of tradition is conducted largely through debating their rights in society. So, not just, you know, uh, now we are moving from just talking about gender being at the core, we are also talking about um, the, um, you know, how do we signify, um, you know, progress of a nation, how do we signify um, uh, tradition of a nation and women through these, um, you know, uh, uh, debates around Sati, debates around the discourses around um, uh, Sati. Um, women somehow, um, you know, um, became emblematic of tradition. And Manik very, very carefully points out that um, the debates evolved to not primarily, um, you know, about women, but about what constitutes authentic cultural tradition. So, the premise of Sati, the premise of, um, you know, um, the abolition of Sati was taken not um, to solve, um, you know, the women's question per se, but uh, for an agenda, for a larger, um, you know, agenda of nation building where, um, you know, women actually um, took a back seat and what was more concerning, um, what was of more significance in those um, debates were the creation of an authentic cultural tradition, which was seen to be done um, through the, um, you know, um, uh, through the emblematic uh, tradition through of a uh, woman. Um, so, uh, you see that uh, again, this is a key work um, in this, um, you know, respect, um, which talks about the role of gender um, in colonial politics. The next work by Tonika Sharkar. Um, the Hindu wife, Hindu nation, community, religion and nationalism looks at um, again family dynamics, marriage dynamics um, and particularly the role of education in this respect um, in, in creation of the nation. So, we see as Sarkar points out um, that abandonment of liberal reformism by the Bengali middle class in favor of the Hindu cultural nationalism was seen, um, you know, um, towards, um, you know, um, this time. And then um, we also see that there was a resistance to mass um, education that, um, you know, um, the idea of a mass education did not fare well with the, um, you know, um, existing society. And there were private questions concerning women and the family remain central to public life and to community and nation. So, you know, we have seen that now consistently from, um, you know, um, the nation and its fragments by Chatterjee to, um, you know, Mrinal Nesina's work on colonial masculinity to um, uh, Latamani's work and now in Tanika Sharkar's work that um, 
you know, the questions, the private questions that define the home and the public questions that define the outer um, sphere of, um, of a society, uh, they were constantly being debated. And um, it, at this point, we see that private questions concerning women and family remain central to public life and to community action. So you see that how much of these, um, you know, uh, colonial politics were actually, um, you know, crafted through um, the inner sphere, through the, uh, you know, the, the private um, spheres of society. And the diversity of women's voices and roles um, that we find in uh, Sarkar's work challenges a single monolithic defini definition of the Indian woman. So we see that there is a use of a variety of voices, um, you know, brought together um, in this uh, work, and and this questions the idea that um, you know. Is there, um, you know, even possible that there is um, an idea of a um, monolithic, uh, you know, idea of an Indian woman? Because you know, there's so much of um, diversity and um, you know uh, differences and you know nuances in these voices that practically um, the idea of a single monolithic definition is, um, you know, um, not possible or not uh, sought for. The next work that we see um, in this respect is um, Anne Stoller's Carnal Knowledge and Imperial Power. And this again is a very, very um, interesting work which looks at um, the, uh, you know, gender negotiations that lay at the center of colonial um, politics. And particularly, as I was saying um, previously, that this work, um, you know, interrogates, it, it questions the cultural categories of European in Europe versus European in colonies. So we see that there were inclusion and exclusion criteria into that category and much of that inclusion and exclusion criteria required sexual regulations um, as uh, Stoller points out and that conjugal and domestic life of both colonizers and their subjects were in focus. So once more we see that the um, you know, the focus is on the um, inner sphere of life. We see that the conjugal and domestic life is in focus here, um, you know, in order to draw um, some of these uh, very important political negotiations. We see that uh, in Stoller's work, uh, she has particularly pointed out, um, you know, pointed out about concubinage. And concubinage was accepted as a social norm. And, um, you know, as we have talked about that, um, you know, it was the obvious choice because it was a cheaper way of serving the colonial interest. And, um, you know, there was, uh, you know, um, there was a time when, you know, it was probably an accepted fact in, um, in the society. But, you know, as time progressed, um, you know, the, um, the uh, social mores changed and um, there were new challenges with regard to this arrangement. And, um, you know, we see that, um, you know, more and more um, challenges were, uh, you know, faced with regard to um, the question of positions over, uh, uh, over the children which were produced out of um, such uh, sexual uh, reg sexual um, arrangements. And um, we also see that um, the social embeddedness of, um, you know, sexuality, what constitutes as morality, of course, changes over time. And so, um, you know, a practice that was probably, um, you know, um, uh, accepted and probably recommended, you know, um, of course, changed over time um, to um, a deviation from the social norm. So um, you see that the social embeddedness of sexuality also evolves over time and Stoller's work is a classic example uh, to show that. And then we have uh, Rachina Majumdar's um, work on marriage and modernity, which we have talked about um, briefly um, in the past uh, lecture that um, looks at some of the, uh, you know, um, the role of, uh, you know, um, marriage or the changing institution of family and marriage uh, with regard to several of these legislations, changes in legislations, particularly the Hindu Succession uh, Act. And um, one of the central arguments that uh, Majundar makes um, here is that challenging the idea that modernizing um, of families, typically um, 
you know is believed to uh, involve transition from an extended to a nuclear structure and from a negotiated marriage to a choice of individual um, partners. But then um, Majundar uh, you know very very effectively challenges this idea in this work and um, talks about uh, you know arranged marriages as um, you know as an evolving institution and uh, as an indicator of modernity as an um, you know as a process you know that has evolved over time and this brings in um, you know new understanding of how uh, you know we understand modernity the idea of modernization and we see the role of the hindu code um, bill which established the centrality of family that emerged as the property subject in immediate post independence um, India. So, the Hindu code bill uh, you know for um, the first time brought the family from um, you know, the, uh, the um, you know inner sphere of um, the society to um, placed it um, you know on the national um, platform um, and we see the emergence of the new patriarchy as we talked about um, before. So, what was the um, you know role of the Hindu code bill um, of 55-56 um, as uh, Majumdar points out is it was a set of three laws which redefined the social boundaries of marriage family and property matters for um, you know um, India right after independence. And um, as you can see that um, through this um, bills um, the marriage uh, you know the idea of family marriage the um, you know the marriage market is actually brought um, to the national um, platform marriage was in a way um, nationalized and we see that an Hi Indian Hindu marriage with the regional and customary variations um, for the first time have a legal notion of a Hindu marriage. So, um, you know there was a need to have you know such a legal understanding, there was a, um, uh, a social um, uh, requirement and um, I would encourage you to go back to each of these works that um, we have just discussed uh, and take a uh, you know deeper look at how um, you know gender actually was at the center of many uh, you know of the significant um, discussions of colonial politics. So, now um, you know drawing from um, these uh, significant works that we just talked about let us look at some of the um, you know trends some of the themes that actually come out uh, of these works. So, we see definitely that there is a you know a huge role that gender plays in empire building and we see that European practice of gendering the colonies as female use of gender and sexual metaphors to manage relationships with the colonies and the colonized. And um, you know a classic work in this respect is um, um, one that we have just uh, talked about Sinha's work on colonial masculinity that um, gendering the colonies as um, female. The next uh, trend that we see is orientalism um, or constructing the oriental woman as the other of the masculine west. So, again um, you know um, much of these uh, colonial politics were successful in creating um, the oriental woman as the other and um, this um, you know um, went a long way in the negotiations um, within uh, family within marriage or outside marriage um, you know as we have seen um, with the um, colonial uh, rulers. We see the idea of the effeminate native. So um, again, uh, it is it, it just became um, you know um, a given, uh, um, you know, a fairly easier task for the colonizers um, if one can reduce. Again, I'm talking about the assumed hierarchy uh, here um, to um, effeminize a particular category of people because of the values, um, the assumed values that are attached uh, to these categories. And the interracial relationships between European men and native women and um, European women and native men um, you know were something that uh, became um, a center point central point of um, a discussion uh, in this regard uh, particularly with regard to possession of over um, children that these uh, negotiations produced. We do see that um, you know um, women had uh, a significant um, place or, or discourse around um, you know women uh, had a significant place in empire building. Um, so, women's conditions as we see um, 
became the index of civilization and the evidence of European superiority and the backwardness of the colonized. So, um, you know, as I said, uh, you know, as um, we have seen in Latamani's work that, um, you know, empire building, nation building was a process that was done um, through using women's, um, you know, conditions, using them as vehicles. So, some scholars have actually, you know, uh, asked in this uh, context, um, when we, you know, talk about the index of civilization, should we use, um, you know, uh, descriptors such as developing countries or should we use descriptors such as previously colonized uh, countries and that is, you know, um, you know, conceptually very different from each other. We also see that the, um, you know, the white women's emigration to the empire um, was, uh, you know, brought with it its own um, uh, uh, power, um, you know, network with it. And the myth of the destructive um, female and the white woman's double burden to civilize both the white men and the natives. So, the, um, it was not just empire building, but you know, um, women uh, as a category, women as, um, you know, uh, as an assumed category had um, a, a significant role. So, we see the women's question um, in nationalism um, was um, seen um, around, uh, you know, two spheres um, that, um, you know, one is the um, sphere of materialism where we have science, technology, rational forms of economic organization, modern methods of uh, statecraft. And then um, there is a, a spiritual sphere where self-identity of national culture would itself be threatened if aping the West um, continues. And much of these two, um, you know, spheres, um, much of the, um, you know, norms, values around these two spheres um, continued, um, you know, in the colonial dynamics using um, the um, idea of gender as a vehicle. So, the project and discourse of nationalism, um, you know, looks at nationalism that was not simply about a political struggle for power as we, um, you know, started this lecture with. It related to the question of the political independence of the nation to virtually every aspect of the material and the spiritual life of the people. And, um, you know, the questions were concerned around, um, you know, whether to accept certain um, you know, things, whether to reject certain things or um, is it desired or not. So, you know, um, it was very, very, um, you know, uh, subtly um, intertwined with the material and spiritual life of people. And again, uh, to bring in the idea of social space, as um, we have seen, uh, particularly in Partha Chatterjee's work, um, the discourse of nationalism, whether it's material or spiritual distinction, were condensed into a powerful dichotomy, the outer and the inner. So, we see that the idea of the ghar and the bahir, the, um, you know, how you define your social space, the home and the world, uh, you know, comes in this regard. and. Um, the world is the external, the domain of the material, the home represents one's inner spiritual self, one true identity. Again, um, this is coming from Chatterjee's work that um, how you create your domestic so social space um, with regard to the, um, you know, discourse with regard to the um, ongoing politics was, um, you know, very, very central to this uh, discussion. We see that uh, new meanings of the home world dichotomy gave an ideological framework within which nationalism answered the women's question. And we have seen, uh, you know, how exactly or, you know, some of the important ways that it was um, done through um, some of the scholarly work we have just talked about. And um, the idea of, uh, you know, accepting modernity or making modernity consistent with the nationalist um, project um, was on the agenda um, and definitely not to dismiss um, the idea of modernity. So, with that um, uh, to, um, you know, end this discussion, um, I will leave you with the idea of the subaltern studies, um, which comes uh, primarily from Gramsci's idea of um, um, hegemony. And, um, you know, we see the growth of the subaltern studies group um, to locate and re-establish a voice or a collective agency in post-colonial India 
for those who denied access those, those who were denied access to representation by colonialism so increasingly we see that um, you know this group of um, scholars um, subaltern group um, you know emerged to you know, re-establish or give um, voice, um, you know, or a collective agency um, to those who were denied access uh, or, or um, you know, um, during colonialism, access to representation during colonialism. And um, one of the pioneering works, again, um, is by Gayatri Spivak, um, Can the Subaltern Speak, which argues that the efforts to give collective voice to a subaltern group creates the problem of dependency upon intellectuals to speak for the subaltern condition rather than allowing them to speak for themselves. So um, Spivak's idea of can the subaltern um, speak um, talks in various levels about agency, um, about the production of discourse um, and the role of the subject um, in, in this regard. So we see that um, theories of gender and post-colonialism offer um, uh, an intersectional and historically nuanced view of social transformations and of political economy of gendered colonial inequality. So we have seen that these um, works, um, you know, that we just talked about, um, you know, they have although not explicitly they have um, you know yet talked about these intersectional um, positions of race gender um, nationality religion um, you know marriage family um, age etc and uh, you know they offer all of them um, actually offer a historically nuanced view of social transformation. So all of these works actually talk about these um, negotiations um, that were happening um, with regard to social transformation, um, you know, in, during the colonial moment in South Asia and um, of political economy of gendered colonial uh, inequalities. So as we see that it is not, uh, you know, just a story of um, political subjugation, uh, it is a much, much broader, um, you know, story than that and, um, you know, the social cultural history, the, um, you know, the intersectional um, cultural history um, where gender played a primary role um, cannot be overlooked. So I want to leave you um, with a question that um, was the colonial project successful in establishing the binary of the spheres as we see it today, if at all, public and private? why and how. So do you think that, you know, having, um, you know, um, discussed this, um, um, you know, these works, these scholarly trends and work, um, do you think that the colonial project um, was successful in establishing the binary of the public and the private? Um, uh, and do we see it today, if at all? Um, or do we see a different binary today, um, again, if at all, um, that is different from um, that one achieved um, as a colonial project? And then, um, you know, reason it as to justify it, um, why and how. If you are interested in further reading, um, please take a look at uh, Lewis and Mills's Feminist Postcolonial Theory, which is a reader. And uh, in the next lecture, I will take up uh, the um, issues of gender, family and marriage. Thank you. Mm -hmm.